Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about the back part of the aircraft. So the horizontal and the vertical stabilizer. How do we actually control them? Why are they there? And can the incorrect use of those control surfaces actually cause accidents? Stay tuned. Wind 31016, right, right. Delta 260. This video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, Brilliant.org will help you understand exactly the kind of things that I'll be talking about in today's video, right? The 501st of you who uses this link here below will get 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant, but as always, it's completely free to click the link and check them out. Right guys, so um, I realized through some of the questions that you guys have been sending me the last couple of weeks that I haven't really explained how an aircraft is properly controlled. And I'm going to try to rectify that partially in today's video. Um, so what we're going to start with, we're going to talk about the horizontal stabilizer, the back wing of the aircraft. So the, the back wing of the aircraft consists out of two parts on the 737. It's a um, horizontal stabilizer that is slightly movable, trimmable, you could say, and also an elevator. Those two surfaces work together to achieve the same thing, which is to control the aircraft in its pitch axis. And the pitch axis is what makes the uh, nose go up and down. Now, first of all, we need to understand why we need a horizontal stabilizer in the first place. So um, an aircraft needs to be stable. Right? We need to be able to control the aircraft in all phases of flight. And the way that that is being achieved is that the center of pressure uh, of an aircraft is actually placed slightly behind the center of gravity. So the center of pressure is where you could imagine that all of the lift force of an aircraft is being, um, is being concentrated. So if you have that here, and then you have the center of gravity here, the center of gravity is the pivoting point that the whole aircraft is moving around. Well then, as you can see, as the lift is pushing upwards to lift the aircraft, that will force a momentum towards the center of gravity that will force the nose of the aircraft down. Okay? Now in order to counteract that, to make sure that the aircraft doesn't pitch uncontrollably down, we need an opposite force. And that is the horizontal stabilizer. So the horizontal stabilizer is actually a wing, it's producing lift, and the lift is opposite. It's actually downwards pointing. Okay, so it's a negative lift. So if you now imagine that you have the center of gravity, you have the center of pressure, and then you have another center of pressure, then the huge force that is required to lift the aircraft has a very small momentum, right? But the small force here that is pushing downwards, has a much larger arm, so it's much bigger momentum, which means that they can stabilize each other out. And this is why the, this tiny little wing in the back, those tiny little rudders, is able to get the aircraft climbing during takeoff and is controlling the aircraft completely in the pitch. All right? So that's how that works. Now, if you have boarded the 737 from the back stairs, you would have seen that the, the, the front part of the stabilizer, the, the actual stabilizer, actually has a couple of degrees indicated and you can clearly see that it's movable. Now what you're seeing there is the amount that we can move the stabilizer trim. So if you've seen cockpit videos, and I've made a video about this as well, you've seen that there's a little wheel in the cockpit that's moving forward and backward from like that. That's the stabilizer trim movement, okay? Now, the reason that we need to be able to move the stabilizer, not all aircraft can do this, smaller aircraft generally can't, but the reason that transport category aircraft do this is because we have both uh, a lot of cabin, right? Inside of that cabin, there's a lot of passengers, and those passengers are either sitting in different places or moving about, walking to the toilets and things like that. And also, the, the aircraft is moving within a huge range of speeds, from the lower speeds that we use during takeoff and landing, where we also have a lot of flaps and slats extended, to the higher speed regime, where we're actually in the transonic area, as in part of the aircraft wing is actually in supersonic airflow. 
Because of that, the center of gravity, when we're moving the flaps, for example, is moving, and also the center of pressure as the, um, as the uh, aircraft increases into transonic speed is moving as well. And as we were discussing before, if either the center of gravity moves or the center of pressure moves, that will change the momentum and it will require more or less force from the, uh, from the horizontal stabilizer. Right? Now, theoretically, the pilot could use our yoke and counteract this pressure just using the elevators. But this would mean that we might take off with a little bit of force needed and then as we increase the speed to get up to the transonic area we would might have to sit with full or not full but a lot of forward pressure or a lot of back pressure. Right? That's not feasible. We need to be able to trim the forces out so we only need forces when we actually need to pitch or uh, pitch the aircraft. And the way we do that is by the stabilizer trim. So the stabilizer is constantly moving a little bit up and down in order to make sure that the forces that we need to control the aircraft are as small as possible. When the aircraft is flying, this is done automatically by the autopilot. Uh, when we're flying manually, we can use a little button on our yoke to control it. Or if that doesn't work, there is actually a little handle on those trim wheels that we can move in order to manually trim the stabilizer. Right? Uh, the, uh, the amount of trim that we need for takeoff is extremely important. Okay, so when we get our load sheet from this dispatcher, the load sheet actually tells us both the weight of the aircraft, as in how much um, thrust we're going to need, you know, to lift, how much weight we're going to need to lift and how much thrust we will need to achieve that. But it also shows where you guys are sitting in the back. What's the center of gravity? And depending on that center of gravity, we will set the stabilizer trim to different values. And if we do this incorrectly, if we would have, for example, too much back pressure, too much nose up, the aircraft could potentially start rotating by itself before we reach the proper rotation speed and the aircraft wouldn't have the speed needed to fly at that point, so it would just hit the tail and tail strike. Or if we have too much nose forward, nose down trim, um, it might be too heavy when we reach rotation speed to actually get the aircraft airborne. So the, uh, the trim setting of the stabilizer is extremely important during takeoff. Uh, we check this at least three times during our checklist work. And then as we get airborne, when we fly manually, we just you can feel it. You feel when the aircraft is too heavy, when then you trim it either up or down. Okay? Get the autopilot in, the autopilot will do it for us. The elevator. The elevator is the actual rudder surface that we need in order to control the pitch. So while the trim is just making sure that the aircraft forces is in equilibrium, the elevator is actually what we use to pitch the, the aircraft. So um, that is controlled by the yoke. When we pull backward, that will uh, put the um, elevator up, which will increase the downforce of the elevator. And since the downforce is increased, you have the center of gravity here, down cross is increased, that puts the nose up. All right? Subsequently, we push it forward, that will decrease the amount of downforce, and the aircraft will push, pitch forward. It is controlled via uh, hydraulic actuators. Both the hydraulic system A and B are involved in, in controlling this. Um, and even if we would have a complete loss of hydraulic pressure, if we only have one system losing, the other system takes over. But if we lose both hydraulic system A and B, well then um, we will still be able to control the elevator through physical um, wires that are connected to the control surface. It will be very, very heavy to do so, but you could control it. Okay? Good. So that's the, uh, the horizontal stabilizer and the elevator. Now, the vertical stabilizer, the fin, that's that large fin in the back of the aircraft, that is there to control the aircraft in the yaw axis. The yaw axis, it was making the aircraft turn like this, okay? So you have the roll axis, like that, the yaw axis, like this, and the pitch axis, which is this and this. Okay, those are the, the three different axes that the aircraft moves around. Uh, the, the fin part of it makes sure that we have the directional stability that we need. And the rudder, which is connected to the back of the fin, is what's controlling the yaw. Okay. Now, as you have noticed, if you look at it, you'll see that the, the rudder is much bigger 
than most of the other control surfaces. And that's because it has to be able to control the aircraft at a very low airspeed, as in when there's very little airflow going over the fin, uh, if we would have a, um, an engine failure. So once again, talking about momentums, the engines, which are situated out on the wings, they produce a lot of forward thrust, right? If we're doing the takeoff, um, the takeoff run, one of the engine fails, the other engine is still producing thrust, but of course now you have a momentum axis to the center of the aircraft. So this will now push like that. So the aircraft could, without the use of rudder, the aircraft would just yaw off the runway. Okay? But since we have the rudder, we can put in opposite rudder to that momentum. We can control the aircraft either until we have rejected the takeoff and stopped or until we've taken off. Okay, that's how we do that. Now, if you want to see how we actually do this, well then, you have the Mentor Aviation app. Well, I've, not, I've talked about the Mentor Aviation app a lot, but I haven't actually showed it to you, okay? Inside of the app, the app is completely free, by the way. You can download it here by the download links. It doesn't cost anything. Inside there, I've done some instructional videos. It's almost two hours worth of instruction in there. And there are collections. So for example, here is the um, engine failure collection. So there's a little description of what is inside each video. And then you have a 360 view of the cockpit together with me and my co-pilot. And in this video, I am demonstrating how we deal with an engine failure during takeoff. Okay. Right. So... That's what the rudder does initially, okay? It needs to counteract the forces in case of an engine failure. But we also use it during takeoff when there's crosswind and landing during crosswind. And I've done separate videos on that. You can check them out if you're interested. Uh, but the other thing that probably the rudder is used most for is to coordinate the turns. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of you have asked me, why does the aircraft have to bank so much when it's turning? Uh, well, what you have to understand is that in order to fly the aircraft, all of the different forces and momentums needs to be in equilibrium. And that goes for the turns as well. So um, an aircraft, if that would turn only using yaw, so if the rudder was the only thing that was turning the aircraft, it would turn like a car. So it would turn like this. And what would happen to you? Well, you'd be pushed out to one side. Okay. Also, if we didn't have the rudder and we only used the um, ailerons to bank the aircraft, well, then you would fall towards the inside of the turn, right? But if we coordinate the turns by putting a little bit of rudder and a little bit of aileron in, well, then we get a perfectly coordinated turn. And the only thing that you notice is that you look out and you see that the aircraft is turning, but you don't actually fall to one side like this. We do that because otherwise it'd be really unpleasant to fly, okay? You will see it well, you, when you're watching out and you're looking and during the departure, it might be a really steep turn. Uh, but if you're looking at your coffee cup, you'll see that the coffee inside of the cup is completely level. That's because the turn is coordinated. When you start your flight training, when you fly in a Cessna or so, you will be doing this by yourself. So you'll be inputting aileron, you'll be inputting rudder and coordinate and turn. You'll have a little slip indicator, slip and skid indicator that will show if you're doing it right. In, in larger aircraft like the 737 for example, we don't do that because it does take a little bit of lag in our perception to do this, which would make you feel a little bit queasy all the time. So we have a device called the yaw damper that does this for us. The yaw damper does other things as well. Uh, it uh, prevents Dutch roll, for example, which is a different thing. But the main thing it does during flight is coordinating the turn. So in the 737, we don't actually push the rudders. The yaw damper does that for us. If we're flying manually, we're just flying with the yoke and we don't do any kind of rudder inputs. Right. So have there been accidents? because of the incorrect use of rudder then? Yes. Unfortunately, if you, if you remember back, uh, just after the uh, September 11th attacks, back in uh, 2000, and I think it was 2001 or 2002, um, there was a fatal crash of an American Airlines Airbus 330. It crashed in Queens, in New York. And uh, the accident investigators initially couldn't really understand why this aircraft had crashed, because it turned out that they came into the wake turbulence behind another aircraft 
and the wake turbulence caused the aircraft to start to, to, to give quite large banks. But the turbulence itself was not enough to crash the aircraft. But somehow, anyway, the aircraft lost control. Um, and it wasn't until they found the flight data recorders that they realized that the pilot flying had been inputting full left, full right, full left deflection on the rudder. And when they looked into the actual design limits of the uh, fin, they realized that those inputs would have been enough to just rip the fin off. And that's what happened. So the fin actually got ripped off the aircraft and as the fin disappeared, the aircraft became uncontrollable and it crashed. So on the 737, we have a limiter in force. This means that as the airspeed increases, the, if we put large amounts of rudder in, it actually de decreases the amount of hydraulic pressure to control the rudder. So the rudder deflections will be smaller at higher speed, even if we make the same input. Having said that, we still can't make full input left and right like this because the, the aircraft fin, sorry, the rudder is huge. The amount of forces it will bring on to the connection of the, uh, uh, the fin to the, to the body is too big, right? We have to be very careful. And this goes for all flight controlled surfaces, but especially the rudder. You have to be very careful as you input rudder because of the sheer size of it and because of the aerodynamic forces created, okay? Now, as you can see, guys, understanding things like momentum forces, lift, things like that is absolutely crucial. You'll find that physics knowledge and math knowledge as you start your ATPL training, for example, is really important. Now, if you are in school now and you're thinking, oh, physics and maths, oh, I hate those classes. I certainly did when I was, when I was younger. Then I highly recommend you to check out brilliant.org, which is the sponsor of this uh, week's video. Okay, Brilliant.org actually makes it fun. I, I go in there sometimes just to, to crack some of their uh, problem solvings. Okay? Uh, and the way that they do it is they, they will um, explain a phenomenon to you. They will give you a problem to solve. And if you solve it, they'll say, bravo, and they will put you on to something harder. And if you don't solve it, they will tell you why it was incorrect, how to think about it. And they give you tools to kind of divide a very complicated problem into chunks and then solve these chunks to solve the whole problem, which is exactly how we deal with big problems in flight. If we are faced with a, a big problem in flight, which is very complex, well, and we try to solve the individual pieces, and then by doing so, we can come to a safe outcome. So I highly recommend you to use this link here below. Those of you who do will get 20% off the annual fee. But once again, I want to stress that it's completely free to check it out. So click the link, check it out. I hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.